Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to the flight box and uh, welcome to uh, this panel. Thanks for coming. It's a real pleasure to see uh, every one of you and some friends and colleagues. Um, so my name is Hayat Benkara. I'm uh, managing this year studio. So this um, event today and the cocktail later on are uh, supported by studio and I'm going to have to read something because I won't remember to um, all the details of uh, this little introduction note. Uh, but basically this um, the, the studio is, uh, was made possible through the Entertainment and Creative uh, Partnerships Fund administered by the Ontario Media Development Corporation, as known as the OMDC, on behalf of the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. The studio is actually a program, it's a one-year program uh, that TIFF launched uh, this year, TIFF uh, Bell Lightbox launched this year. And uh, please, I will encourage you to uh, go to our website at tiff.net slash studio. Uh, you'll find uh, all the details about this program. And basically, it's a program, it's a one-year program for content producers, filmmakers, writers, uh, screenwriters. And uh, we, of course, have some uh, partners on this program. And the partners are Ubisoft, the Directors Guild of Canada, the Writers Guild of Canada, the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television, Women in Film and Television Toronto, and the Canadian Media Co Producers Association. Um, so this year we selected 16 producers, content producers that are coming from very different backgrounds, documentary, fiction, television, and transmedia or new media. And uh, basically we are trying to uh, have these people meet with uh, experts and leaders in their field in the film industry. Um, it's a 360 program, so every other weekend uh, they meet with um, people from uh, the screen screenwriting field or from production. Uh, we talked about co-productions. We talked about transmedia. Uh, this weekend, we're just finishing and we just had a roundtable before coming here about marketing, branding, uh, audience building, and we are going uh, again in February and March, April with other types of subjects. And um, we will have also mogul sessions. Uh, those are every two months. Uh, and uh, please go to the website and uh, you can have a, a chance to see at who the guest speakers have been so far and who they will be in the coming months. Uh, and um, now I would like to um, introduce uh, this uh, wonderful panel that we have with us. And I will ask actually Sandra Kinningham, who is going to be the moderator on this panel, to introduce our guests. Uh, about with um, sorry about the film Goon, uh, and we are very happy to have uh, a few uh, people that were key in making this wonderful success uh, that uh, we can be very proud of. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hyatt. And it is indeed my pleasure to be here tonight and to talk to people who are part of the studio and to actually have the chance to dissect the story of a film that counts as one of the most successful English-Canadian feature films, and, and the title is Goon, and many of you have seen it, I'm sure, and more will, because it's playing later tonight. But what better way to dissect and, and understand how to make a successful movie than to bring together three of the people that actually go together from the very beginning to make that happen, i.e. the director, producer, and executive producer, um, distributor. Um, it's been since 2000 in Canada, as many of you know, because you've been working in the industry, the real mantra has been about getting to Canadian audiences and box office has been at the center of that. And while that is really changing now as we move into other platforms and other markets, box office is still that very elusive key um, to a film success. And Goon is a film which many of you know grossed over five million dollars at the Canadian box office. It actually grossed over three million pounds in the UK and uh, had a release in the US. So we're going to talk about this, but in terms of, uh, um, I want to first introduce the people that are going to be here talking with me about this. And, and this, we will, we will speak for as long as we're given, but at the same time, uh, we appreciate any questions from the crowd, and this can become interactive at any point in our conversation. So certainly you're all working in the business. You know, these people are here to talk to you tonight, so we're, we're, we can have, make it a larger conversation at any point, and certainly, if not before the last half hour, we will definitely toss it over to you. 
But with no further ado, I'll start with Michael Douse in the center, the director of Goon. Uh, Michael is from Calgary, currently lives in Montreal, both really key, I think, to his success. He came onto the scene with a film called Fubar, and which is how I learned what fucked up beyond all recognition meant uh, back in 2002. And it really did take the country by storm. Uh, and, uh, and was a different kind of comedy, something that we expected our Canadians to do outside the country and bring back. So it was really original and bold. He has since gone on to direct the very successful It's All Gone Wrong, Pete Tong, um, another huge box office success, and uh, has gone on to do FUBAR 2, um, recently Goon, and he has just wrapped shooting and is in post-production on the F Word that is going to be a Fox Searchlight distributed. I think on your f on your f on your Fubar films, you both in your first one. I think you were writer, director, producer, editor. Yes, producer yes. and so, editor. Yeah. So there's a recipe for success right there, as we know. But uh, welcome, Michael Douse. Thank you. Um, now, Don Carmody is most known recently for being celebrated for hitting the hundred film mark in his career, and he's still counting. Not many of us can say that. Um, Don has been producing films for a long time in Canada, <laughs> let's say. Thank you for being here. A long time. Uh, important films at that. He's actually been somebody that straddled purely Canadian films, international films, uh, U.S. films that have gone on to great success, that he was very key to bringing them to Canada, Goodwill Hunting, uh, Chicago. He was, a, he was behind the, the cult hit Boondock Saints. He uh, has done all of the Resident Evil franchises, which have been extremely meaningful to our you know, Canadian box office and history, and is showing that Canada has the power to actually produce great hits of all genres. He just wrapped up, I think, on the Immortal Instruments that's coming out. It's a new franchise, I believe. Uh, he also was behind uh, Denis Villeneuve's Polytechnique and uh, more recently worked with uh, Sud Sutherland on his film called Home... I'm just forgetting the title, Don. Okay. Home Again, uh, that premiered at TIFF last year. So big and small, Don has actually um, made breakaway. Just the, the endless titles that are that go from small to big, and he has is a wealth of experience. So please take advantage of his candor, which I have grown to expect from Don, which I'm sure will be on uh, on tap tonight. Welcome, Don. <laughs> and. Mark Sloan, somebody I've had the pleasure of knowing for quite a while, for as long as I've been in this business, and he's been a long-time distribution executive, senior vice president at Alliance Films, uh, the uh, a leading pr distributor of motion pictures in this country, um, for now. Um, and we are... <laughs> um, and I'm told there's very little, and, and to be fair... <laughs> And to be fair to Mark, that's not what we're here to talk about tonight because there's not a whole lot to say yet. But we can, uh, Michael and Don have agreed to talk about the distribution scene if you'd like. Um, and Mark has, uh, <laughs> Mark has, uh, Mark has been uh, with Alliance Films. He's in charge, is, is really behind some of the more creative and successful marketing campaigns of a number of, of foreign and Canadian films and, and brings the expertise of the international titles to the Canadian scene and has really got, garnered a reputation over the years with working very closely with Canadian filmmaking teams. And I know that from personal experience. So it's, you know, that's why it's no, no surprise that he would be here tonight to be able to talk about how that team works together from the very beginning. And he's certainly been behind a lot of very successful films. And I know had a great deal of fun on Goon, and, which is why I know you're happy to be here tonight as well. So welcome, Mark. So one of the things it's... Rather than doing the anatomy of a success from talking about the box office, just to give you a... The film had its premiere at the Toronto Festival in 2011. It went on to have a UK release before its North American release in January of 2012, where, as I said, it grossed over three million pounds, an extraordinary success for, for, for any film, any independent film. It then released in Canada. Uh, Alliance took it out in Canada in February. And at the same time, there was a premium VOD uh, release in the U.S. by Magnolia, their magnet releasing, and followed by a March 30th theatrical release. So we can talk about a lot of the patterns of how it went out and how they marketed it. And how the, but what I'd like to do is go back to the beginning, because I think unless you, 
I mean, if we all knew what the recipe was for success, uh, we'd all be doing it, and we'd all achieve it every time. There's obviously a lot of alchemy, there's a lot of intuition, but there's also formality. But I think it's really interesting to take advantage of the the, the people we have in this room who have been doing very specific things very successfully for a while to understand what goes through their minds at the very beginning, what attracts them to something. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists tonight, uh, starting, I guess, with Mike and then Don and Mark, um, how Goon came to you and what it was specifically about the script or the packet or whatever it was that drew you to it and made you want to make that an important part of your... Um, for me, the script came to me through Jay Baruchel, um, who I'd met a couple times in Montreal and um, had talked to about other projects, and he had mentioned this project. So I just said to to him, when you're ready to show the script, can you send it to me? And um, he did that, and I threw my hat in the ring right away. And, um, you know, what was interesting to me was I thought there was a need for... Um, a more realistic hockey film, something that, that's a little bit more visceral, a little bit, a um, little bit more based in realism. And uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. And um, we won't say and, more than yeah. what. And then um, there was also um, there was an actor, Sean William Scott, was loosely attached to it. So that was that's always something I look for in terms of a project. If there's cast attached, that's always a massive hurdle. Um, and then I just liked the team. I liked all the production team. And, um, you know, I was just excited to make a hockey movie. I'm a really big hockey fan. And um, I thought the speed of the game was something interesting. And I thought if you could do it right, it would have a huge, it would have, a, it would have an audience for sure. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that's what attracted me to it uh, initially was that for sure. Don? Um, <clears throat> I'd always been kind of pissed off that Slapshot was not a Canadian movie. And it's always been kind of a... A, a thing in my head and uh, I'm always looking for for good comedy scripts and uh, I got approached well, a couple of years uh, before by a young wannabe producer called David Gross who is now a producer he just produced F word with uh, with Mike again and he had uh, this script uh, called Goon and uh, that Jay Baruchel and Evan Goldberg had written, and there was a possibility that Sean William Scott might be interested. And uh, I read it and immediately realized that this indeed could be a Canadian goon. So uh, I very willingly um, came on board with the idea that I would help uh, put the picture together and uh, secure the financing and all of that. Met with uh, you know with Jay and uh, Evan over the phone and. Uh, you know, uh, was intrigued by Mike Dowse, who I thought was British because of Pete Tong. <laughs> <laughs> I was very pleased to learn he was Canadian and had done FUBAR. So um, that was another uh, huge plus for me. So it seemed all the elements were there and um, became actually the first film that uh, I considered financing through the Canadian system. And was it, can I ask you, because I think that's really important, you read the script, it was obviously written by... Jay and Evan, who had carved out substantive careers for themselves and were known, was that how much did that play into it, or was it literally just when you read a script, does it come off the page? Is there something? Had, did you read an advanced draft? How close to was it to? It was an earlier draft. There, there's no question. And believe me, I've read a lot of terrible scripts from very famous actors. <laughs> so, no, that <laughs> didn't really uh, uh, equate that much. But uh, I just thought this is really funny can be really funny in the right hands and uh i wanted to see it yeah i, I thought the script was hilarious and you know it, it, it needed some help but not a lot and i thought what was great about it was that they had they had really given their own tone to the film you know it was it wasn't a rip off of slap shot but it was definitely um a nod to it and uh but they had they had a lot of great details right about hockey which i thought was amazing and it was something I wanted to do more was to put more great details in about hockey and make it more and more more of what they were doing I thought I, I just thought the script was fantastic and a really great launching launching spot to make it interesting a fantastic you both movie. actually love hockey and that's at the center of it uh, you didn't just go out and say this is a commercial film it was like you always thought Slapshot should have been a Canadian film you wanted to make a good film about hockey. And I'm sure, Mark, you thought that doing a violent film about an enforcer at a time when enforcers committed suicide was a big topic in Canada was a real attraction for you. <laughs> well, you know, the, 
No, the reality is the cycle of these things, of course, takes takes a long time. And so that's it actually had come together at the time. And it might be interesting to talk a little later about how when we did the marketing and when Mike was, you know, uh, going and doing the PR tour, how we had to strategize about how best to approach that subject, which you couldn't ignore. But at the same time, uh, you know, you couldn't make the focus of it because, you know, the, this was a fiction film, you know, and it wasn't, you know, to be reality. In terms of that initial thing with the script, I think it was Mike brought it to me in the first place. We had worked together on on Fubar and and uh, and Pete Tong already. We knew each other well, and I knew Mike was like the kind of guy who was going to get this material well. But I have to tell you, it's funny these guys say hockey. I, what I loved about it best was it was Shakespearean in in the way these characters were drawn. You know, especially uh, the Liev Schreiber character, who's this King Lear kind of guy near the end of his career. You know, and and it wasn't just a uh, a violent joke or a gross out joke kind of a comedy, but it had like so many great comedies. These characters that actually had some real depth to them. These weren't, they weren't all just 2D guys. Well, a couple, couple of, you know, comic relief, but a lot of them had real, real depth to them. So the combination of the stars, Mike's talent, knowing Dawn was there, this really great script. I mean, in, in, it, it completely, completely easy one to, uh, to jump on board yeah, with. The, the voice of Doug was definitely in, inherent in the script. And that was a massive uh, thing for me. It was just how, just how unique that voice was and just that that idea of like a gentle giant who had a real dichotomy in his life who was very nice to people but also crushingly violent on the ice and had strong ideals i just thought it was a nice mix of sort of chauncey the gardener and rocky balboa and it was just there was a really nice heart to that film that was definitely on the page when you first read the script you know that was that would make an interesting story and it does come through yeah. it does come through what did you went so you all got involved in your own way, when you talked to you, Sean William Scott was actually a friend of, or was brought originally to the project by Jay in terms of interest, wasn't a locked deal, but obviously really liked the project. Where did you go from there in terms of the casting? Because I have to say it is quite, it's an incredible cast, this film. Like, I mean, apart from all of the other good things about the film, you have Schreiber, what a brilliant idea. Um, Eugene Levy, what a coup. Um, these are things that you know, we know attract audiences, we know people follow. So what was your process? Um, you know, I think casting is all about momentum and we, we were in an advantage because our writer was an actor and we had Sean, um, as much as you can get Sean, you know, without paying him a great deal of money, you know, to officially have him attached. But we went down and met him and, and he was, couldn't be more enthusiastic about the project. And as soon as I laid eyes on him, cause I was, cause Sean has, you know, Sean's a, Sean's a really underrated actor, and he's, he's done these really great dramatic parts that a lot of people haven't seen, and he's mostly known, you know, for his success, and that success is a bit of a baggage for him as an actor, and um, after meeting him and after seeing all of his work, I just thought, this guy's amazing, he's like a real movie star, and, you know, getting Sean was huge, and keeping Sean was huge, and that was just sort of a standard thing that what we just had to sort of What was that timeline between that? It, it was, I know it's it was, momentum is really important. It was long. It, he was uh, on before, and, and I think yeah. it's always that thing of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, and then we were like, okay, well, now we're shooting, so we're two yeah. months out, are you still? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah we're in, yeah. so. And when we had Kevin Smith announcing that he had Sean for his movie, so there was yeah. all of that going on. We're just trying, you know, it takes a, a, a long time to to finance a movie and before we could officially you know say he's ours we had to keep you know him in the loop and we were also got lucky timing wise that sean was on a bit of a downturn and uh, we could afford him yeah. and he you know uh really in, uh, liked the project and fortuitously jay happened to be on a set with him and pitched him and uh got his interest so and, and jay kept that thing percolating along so, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the Reardon thing was a little bit more in that we really, that was all part of our, our financing, was we had to get a name for that character that would satisfy the international, the, sales. the international sales. And we went through a lot of different names and... and a lot of fluctuations, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We had, you know, when we were going out to Leev, the person that was involved with it at that point was like, oh, yeah, Leev's, yeah, we'll get him. They have all these numbers for stars. So he's like, he's a two. Whatever that means, I don't know. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah, and then you know, and then, you, and then you get them, and suddenly they're like, oh, he doesn't work anymore. Like, what the what the fuck happened? <laughs> yeah, right. He's great. Yeah. So he was, um, you know. So there's a lot. There's pressure, but I think that's good pressure because uh, at the end of the day, you want people to see your film, and I think it's okay to embrace that that pressure from um, international sales. You just kind of got to guide it a little bit and sort of put your own stamp of taste onto it, and hopefully, 
you know, you don't end up with turkeys. Yeah, birds. and he, he was amazing. I he mean, was great. I mean, she's yeah. sure. And of course, we inherited Jay Barrett, so we had to put him somewhere. <laughs> But, <laughs> but the rest of the cast, I mean, Allison came on. Once you get momentum and you get yeah. two people locked in, it's easier to go to Liev and say, okay, well, we got these guys. Mm -hmm. And then he jumped on, and then Allison, I think Allison was on before Liev. And then yeah. um, and then getting guys like Kim Coates and Nick Campbell is just, they were just very nice. We just approached them. We didn't have a lot of money, but we said they're great parts and really like to work with you. And they saw the rest you. of the package. Mm -hmm. They saw the rest yeah. of the package, and yeah. it, it kind of it snowballs from there. Was there. How does it work for you, Mark, on the Canadian front? Sometimes there's a different perspective in Canada from international sales. Was there any tension at all or in this process of casting in terms of who should play that? It's always tense in the it? sense that, you know, particularly with the Canadian films, I find, there's this tendency to recognize that you need a star but not have the commitment or the sometimes the, the result of lack of money, but not actually getting there with the star and getting close um, so that you've paid somebody enough money that you've heard of their name, but they don't actually sell tickets or help to, you know, to, 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 to increase revenues. Um, but you've still got this kind of name that you sort of have to work with. And in this case, they had come because Jay was already there. And at that end, remember, there was like, you know, Tropic Thunder and all these other great, like, he was really, really hot. And, and so right away, you felt like you had and something Canadian. that had that kind of momentum. Well, the right. Canadian thing, you know, believe me, as you can imagine, we see the same Canadian names over and over and over on every casting list because everybody's going to go out and get Ryan Reynolds and make get them to do, you know, a Canadian film. And then he does one once in a while, too. You know, you someone know. once said there should be a checkbox on the applications with actors' names because you see the same ones all the time. It's a small pool. Yeah. But but for us, I think that we're very much in the North American perspective. Like like so many of the Americans who are buying, we're looking for the next guy, the guy's the hot new guy, and so on and so forth. And that does seem to conflict with international, which often is looking for somebody who's already proven um, more historically. Um, I'm not the expert on the international front, but I often see those two things competing quite a bit. You know, the up and coming name never seems to be as interesting to me to foreign as it does to to domestic. But Sean was great because he had, you know, he he still had international value, as they would say, and and he's, um, but he's also so funny. Like he has such a great history behind him, but he's also gettable. You know, he's 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 willing to work and hungry for different roles, and I think that's sort of the sort of sweet spot you're looking for is somebody who's maybe had a, a bigger time in the sun and is sort of on his way back up a bit. Um, if you can find that right alchemy of finding the right guy who still has a bit of name recognition, who will actually be great in your film, then. You know, it's sort of the, the golden key to getting the film finance. And then once we had, you know, uh, Liev on board, we still kept trying to get as many great actors as we could into there. And that led to the Eugene Levy thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were very pleased and, and uh, that, that Gene was interested in the movie. Um, but, you know, he wasn't going to work for scale. So, and we didn't have much more than scale for the father role, but we realized how important it would be. So... <laughs> Then we had to start refinancing to uh, try and get the money to, because we'd already put up most of our fees to get Leo Schreiber. Um, so to get Gene Levy, uh, we had to go back to the well, so to speak. And the well at most of the funders was pretty dry. And it was, uh, was surprisingly enough, Manitoba Film and Sound. We took them out to dinner and we were bemoaning. And uh, they said, well, we think that's a good idea. And we'll, uh, how much do you need? And we said, like, we need another hundred grand. And he said, okay, we'll give it to you as long as we can get a preferred position, which didn't happen. And, but they stayed in there, and they were really good and even picked up the tab for dinner. So, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, I mean, everybody was really excited about where we were going with the cast. And, uh, I, and I think the proof is in the pudding that uh, they're terrific. Yeah. Yeah, all the parts are well cast. I mean, I think you, you well, mentioned Well, it's that. also, I mean, it's the thing about when you look at all the budget, and, and on the last film I've done, we had the similar thing where we said, okay, well, we have X amount of dollars to get these people, but somehow the producers find a way to spend a little bit more money on, a, on like another $50,000 to get another person, and it's just that extra spark that, that really helps, That that's, you know, a guy that you can't keep your eyes off or a girl you can't keep your eyes off that really sort of just adds another cornerstone to the cast um, which is in my mind in terms of an eight million dollar budget I mean I'm biased but it's a it's a I couldn't think of more better money to spend on a film and I think that gets overlooked I think mm -hmm. you get a line item of this is what your cast is and that's concrete and you should say and you got a deal I think you got to wheel and deal a little bit more with the agents and and with your own budget to try and get more money for that cast <laughs> because yeah. it's everything you know it doesn't matter who's directing it it's, who the cast is. That's really what's going to happen, you know. You can't. Oh, you can't overstate it. I'm wondering, 
this film has a target audience that I certainly is clear when you've seen it. I'm sure it was clear to you making it when you had the script. Who does the casting have anything to do with who's a bit when the, when the aid, when the foreign sales agents and and funders or yourselves even are you thinking at all about who's going to be seeing it and they're going to be attracted to this actor or is it tr much more intuitive in terms of this story, this actor, or that he's working in a certain market? Well, the foreign funders, I think, they have their own agendas. Right. Um, you know, one, obviously something that excited us about getting Gene Levy with Sean William Scott is like all of a sudden we've got, whether it is or it isn't, it's a sequel to American Pie, which it's not. But in the minds of that audience, our target audience, they were like, oh, cool. You know, Stifler and, and Dad, you know, so. Um, and, and it's funny, you see all of the tweets and all of the online stuff, and it's like, wow, man, Stifler was great, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, he's not Stifler, he's Doug the Thug, you know. But, but it clearly they, attracted yeah. that. So yes, that exactly. was a, a ploy in, in terms of yeah. marketing after the fact. Right. right, and the American Pies weren't as popular overseas as they were uh, domestically. But, you know, Sean had been in so many other things, so uh, there was that. But... Uh, I mean, they were concerned. They didn't know who Allison Pill was, but, you know, uh, Gene Levy helped because he's been in so many comedies as well. So all of these things helped different uh, quadrants. We talked, we've referred a couple of times to financing, and I think it's important just to, for those of you making films and raising the money, this was, you mentioned, Mike, $8 million? I don't know. Or uh, I, I, a I, bit I more. That. Okay, <laughs> but can we talk? I mean, without being as specific as you feel you can be, or as, but I think it's important to say, you know, how was the film funded, and generally where did it come from, and how many different players were involved? I noticed on IMDb when I was just trying to make sure I had all the credits, there are 14 producers credited. That's <laughs> what it takes to make. It, now there's line producers and associate producers. So Don, don't get too um, yeah. uh, weirded out. But it's well, that's it's actually really, part of the financing because it is part of the financing. It, it increasingly. is because, uh, as I say, it was the first time I was using the actual Canadian model, aside from the early days of my David Cronenberg movies, which was one-stop shop with the Canadian Film Development Corporation. But so we got into it, and we had Telefilm, uh, you know, very very supportive. And uh, we had had we had Alliance in from a very nice minimum guarantee. We had various and sundry. We had a, a previous foreign sales agent who kept getting cold feet and was never standing up for his numbers. And uh, one of the first things I, I think I did was say, "This is you know, if he's not going to increase his numbers, we can't finance this movie. I've got to get another guy." So I brought in Kirk D'Amico from uh, Myriad, who m understood the material much more. And he gave us numbers that we could actually borrow against for the gap. And, uh, you know, National Bank got involved. It was This is the first time they had done gap financing, so it was a bit of a, a learning curve for everybody and very expensive legally and, and what have you. And then it came down to the pictures written for Halifax. I went to, to Nova Scotia and said, how much can we get here? And they said, the most we can give you is $200,000. And I went to Manitoba and said, looks a lot like Halifax to me. And they were like, $350,000. <laughs> but, and then to maximize the tax credits, which are really good in Manitoba, we had to have a Manitoba producer. So then we brought in Inferno to be the Manitoba producer. And then we were still short. So I was like, oh... So my financial guru is a guy called Joe Iacono out of Montreal who does all my tax deals on all my big movies as well. And he said, we need to structure this as a interprovincial co-production and see if we can get Sodec. And I went, oh yeah, Sodec's really going to put their money into an English hockey movie. But I brought in Andre Rouleau, who had been my, my partner on Polytechnique and a couple of other movies, and who loved the material as well. And hence, that's another producer, now the Quebec producer, because I need a Quebec producer. But he actually got Sodec to come in for, for money. I think it was 300000 that Now, that is that came in. partly because in this case, Michael, the director. Oh, it, it made sense. It, Mike was resident a Montreal? resident. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, we looked at it. Jay's a Montreal resident. Yeah. Mike's a Montreal resident. Bobby Shore, who was our DP, was a Montreal resident. So it, 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 it helped grease the wheels in. And uh, Marc Andre Grodin. And, and Marc Andre Grodin, who was always uh, on our, our casting list. That helped. Uh, it intrigued uh, Sodak, um, and it was big fights in Sodak about funding this movie to that level. 
And um, we also went in there with French materials. Oh, like we yeah. really we treated it like a Quebec project going in, not like carpetbaggers coming in from English Canada. Yeah. No, exactly. So uh, they came in, but all of these different layers that we were adding uh, were adding to the complexity. And as I like to tell people, is that you know I do the Resident Evil films, which are you know have stretched from forty to eighty million dollars, and my paperwork's like that. The paperwork for each funder on this movie was like that. So we had stacks at the end. And I've never paid so many legal uh, expenses in my life because we paid for everybody's different legal and what have you. So it was very, very complicated putting the deal together. Um, and that's actually with a script that everybody, it sounds like everybody involved saw the picture. They saw what you were trying to do. They appreciated the talent involved. They knew that Mike had a sensibility that was right. Like this was actually a very well supported picture. Still very complicated to, to finance. No. So, so now you get to shoot the film, and uh, you're in post. Was there anything, because I want to get us to the whole idea of finishing the film and the testing and taking it out to audiences, but was there anything at all in that process from the script to screen during either the shoot or post that um, really surprised you or was different or just even one anecdote, because I'm sure there were lots of things, but was there something that particularly that happened that changed during that process for you? For me, um, no, I just pleasant surprise i mean it was it was a weird shoot because we shot in manitoba during hockey season so we had to shoot weird hours on ice like 11 p.m to 11 a.m every day so it was a weird sort of vampire shoot or beyond vampire shoot and we uh, threw parties every weekend to keep them up <laughs> <laughs> but um no i mean it was just I, I just thought there was a great there was a great camaraderie camaraderie when we made the film and i think that translated into the um into the shoot so um, no, we, I mean, the shoot was relatively uncomplicated. Um, technically, it wasn't crazy. You know, we're in one, one ice rink for three weeks. Um, but uh, no, just pleasantly surprised by the performances I was getting and by the support I was getting as well. And, and just really happy with the dailies and what we were doing and, uh, and just trying to keep that train running and, and being as enthusiastic. And you, you, were, you were working with some people you'd worked with before in terms of key positions? Uh, cinematographer, cinematographer yeah. and editor, yeah. So, yeah. but no, the producers are all new to me, and the writers. And to know, that end, me, it was fun. It was fun yeah. working with the um, having the writers on set. You know, was really fun in terms of adding having Jay and uh, his friend Jesse on set. It was great just for throwing out lines and just having an, having two guys' brains just turning out jokes. Like the Rudy joke comes from that where it just comes across on a piece of paper i'm like oh yeah let's do that and see what happens you know yeah so one of the things i want to point out here is that because i'm sitting here and he's not but uh david gross and uh our exec producer jesse shapira those two guys it was a baptism by fire for them yeah, because for sure. obviously the financing was so complicated i spent a good deal of my time back here you know screaming at people and then flying back to manitoba and, and screaming at us and well yeah well, hey. uh, <laughs> but no, but no those question. Guys, Who wrote uh, the cameo, yeah. Don? Or was that improvised? Your cameo in the film? My cameo was due because I think I had the wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> he, rips, he rips up the, the prices in the, in the uh, cameo because he ripped up the production designer's budget in front of him. <laughs> 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 no, this. I was like, I gotta put that in the film. Inspired. Yeah. So, no, but I mean, so it was. David, you were going back to so David. Yeah, David and just a real baptism by fire. And they were amazing, and uh, they were yeah. dealt with it every day. I mean, some pretty crazy stuff, and uh, and also were able to finance us through those dark days of, of where many, as you you know, you mm -hmm. must have experienced that, where you yeah. know you, you got to rent the photocopier in the office, and then about four weeks in, you got to start paying some some salary, <laughs> however it works. And they got us through that, and they were the first to say, "Let's find the money to get the better cast," you know, and don't yeah. worry about it. And incredibly supportive in that way. Yeah, so uh, definitely there, and uh, but the the improv uh, process I, I found was amazing. It's the first time I've ever had to tell a writer, "Could you say the damn line the way it's written at least once?" <laughs> 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 because he was constantly uh, ad libbing with some great, great ad libs. I was there on the set when you guys were coming up with a line about, you know, uh, the Allison's great line that is probably the the favorite female line in the film is oh, this is, you um, make me want to stop sleeping with a whole a bunch of guys line. that's <laughs> actually a written line that was that was that's Jay Baruchel's line that's yeah. that's a great line um, 
But yeah, the, the shoot was great. I mean, it was, you know, not without its problems, but not yeah. unlike anything else you've ever done. But teamwork, film. a good collaboration, yeah. which at the heart of all of it and to get through it. Just fucking cold. That's the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's Winnipeg. Fucking cold. Uh, I know. Um, so now in post in the edit, in terms of what was that, at what point did this become, like how much of a team, did you have some exclusive time with your editor? At what time did it open up? You had a lot of, obviously you had the writers on the set. Clearly, I imagine they were also involved. Jay was also a producer. What was your process to get to that final cut um, in terms of collaboration? The cut, it was a big, um, it was a big edit. I mean, a lot of material. It could be guilty of overshooting, um, right, you would say? But uh, a lot of improv. A lot of improv. So there's a lot of material to to wave through. So the the cut um, takes a long time. I quit smoking during this cut, ten days in. So that didn't help. So I was an absolute <laughs> maniac, um, which definitely didn't help the process. Um, probably added another month to the edit. I would say. Um, the editor didn't try and find ways to get you to start again. No, he, he didn't. Afraid of him. No, because I almost put him in the hospital by smoking on Fubar Two in the edit suite, and he actually had to check into the hospital one night. So. He was. He would take the well, non-smoking deaths. Than the, um, um, but then, what what was interesting for me as a as a director was working with Evan and Jay in terms of the whole process of ADR because we'd get through and we would cut the film and, but then there was this whole stage of ADR which was new to me. I mean, I've done ADR before, but not like comedy building ADR, which was great, which was which added at least another ten or fifteen good like a b so writing going on there's writing going on out. all the time and literally looking at the film and saying every time there's an opportunity to try and put a joke in at least trying to do it and and it's expensive but the price of it or the 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 result of it is like i said like 10 or 15 maybe 20 big laughs in the film or at least solid laughs yeah, it's great that the goalie had a mask we could make him say anything he could say anything yeah, <laughs> yeah he does say a lot now but I'm that also but that. it's also an expensive posting because you got to have more adr cutting you got to bring in the actors for more time you've got to spend that money so was this but they contingency were very supportive Don, or of doing was this it. yeah uh, we were burning through the contingency just it yeah. was always nobody wanted to make a so-so movie right we wanted to make as good a picture as we could possibly do it so and we went uh, just okay. So let's when did do you it. start it. showing it to people? I know there's the process we all go through where you show it to friends and family, and then there's a much more formal process that we tend to do. And comedy is very particular. I'm sure you want to show it to people, but how did what shape did that take? What did you learn from it? And at what how early in your process did you start showing? I usually it to start people? showing. It. I I usually my contracts I get ten weeks to cut alone, and then um, and they were, they gave it to me on this one. Um, I think it's a really important process that I don't think, think gets respected enough. It's not law here; it's law in the states. Well, law, but it's it's in the union in the states, but it's not it's not here. Um, I think it's an incredibly important process. So I I usually start showing it around seven weeks to friends and family, depending on where the cut is. And I think it's a very important process of just, even if you put it up in front of 10 people or 20 people, you start to get the rhythm of the comedy and the jokes and seeing what lands and what doesn't. And that just graduated up all to a, uh, a full-blown test, which went horrifically, which I'll let you talk about. <laughs> so uh, so um, was the test before, so this ADR where you were adding all of the jokes, was that before post or post-lock? So post, post the end, but not post the test you're going to tell us about? Well, no, we, we like to test at least two times. And one is the one that we do during the edit so that the filmmakers have the opportunity to actually respond to the comments and the reactions they get from the audience. And up till that point, they had been testing the friends and family stuff. So, you know, people who were knowledgeable, who knew the material, who I'm sure were giving their own comments, but weren't coming at it ice cold and perhaps seen stuff multiple times or had a bias like because they, they knew who it was. When we do our test, it's 300 people who we recruit in a cinema. In this case, we did the, uh, the Queen's Way out on the border between Etobicoke and, and downtown. And, uh, uh, you know, an even mix of men and women, an even mix of ages, you know, 18 up to 54. And, you know, our goal is to start to try to understand who the audience is, but most importantly, to be able to give these guys the kinds of feedback that can, like you say, make it, make it better, you know? And one of the things Mike always said on all the films was not funny enough, not funny enough. Like, we always heard that from you every time you would show us a cut or you'd say it was like this, but it's not funny enough yet. And this was really a nice empirical way. And, and what happened, he says, horrific, when the screening was going on, we thought we were nailing it. Like, people were laughing. It seemed like they were with it. And I remember you came out and said, oh, yeah, we nailed oh, that. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then, you know, they do this quick count right afterwards where they go through all the ballots and they count just the first couple of questions. What'd you think of the movie and would you tell your friends to go see it? The top two boxes. They call it the top two. That's what you hear. And uh, it, it wasn't good. <laughs> it really wasn't good. And, you know, the, the look on everybody's face was just this, like, long, what went wrong? And, you know, disbelief. You know, disbelief. Perhaps there was something screwy in the counting or something. It had screened, it had screened really well, like. Tons of big laughs and you know people into it, but the lesson that we learned from that was were it. Were you in the screening? Fuck so yeah. you were in there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was um, it was too violent, and you know it was it just was more violent than what we way saw? more violent oh, yeah. than we had. Yeah. And so that was the biggest lesson. I mean, we had we still. Yeah, some I was like points. a broken record about that, but from the beginning he did but. to be to give him credit, he did. He was talking about you can't use that much blood. You got to be careful. You can't. You know, you're gonna you're gonna uh, you know alienate people and. Sure enough, we so, did. I, and how a did where wrote, he, were there specific questions that related to the violence that were answered? We asked like, we asked like, these sort of adjective based questions. Do you find it too much, too little, and that stuff? And then at the end, not just that first night, but later, you get a much more detailed, sophisticated report that actually drills down and says, you know. And what was interesting was all quadrants it felt that way. It wasn't, you know, you expect sort of women over a certain age to say, oh, a little too much for me. But it was interesting how consistent a comment that was coming back from the from from all uh, we had all parts. A really of that. nasty ankle break that is in there in the film to a little bit, but he literally used to snap it in half and land on a stump. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> literally. This quadrant. And it, was like, and it was literally like we had the audience, had everybody in their hands, and then the ankle snaps and lands on the stump and we lose everybody. And everybody's like, I'm not fucking recommending this movie. Nobody's gonna go see this movie. This is terrible, this is heinous. And it's, it's, it was, and that was a hard thing for me to cut because I liked the visceral aspect of it. I was like, oh, we got them. Look, they're all groaning. And no, they're groaning. I know, and, they, and that's important to say disgusting. because, in fact, and it's important to note that, Don, this was something you had been thinking because these are conversations. And, in fact, you're lucky it was something that obvious because often it's not quite so easy to see exactly why it's working and not. But I'm sure because you'd come up with a cut you felt was really working and audience was punting, it is hard to go back. But so discussion... There was also stuff about editing the hockey and the nature of the hockey and how people in Canada have this innate sense of what hockey editing should look like and how and how this related into it. Um, Don worked on another, we worked on another hockey movie together this year where it was a, a bigger issue. But it's interesting how much, how many conventions there are that an audience knows, even if they can't quite articulate it, they clearly know what it is. And it, it often does come out in this testing process and how you have to tweak that stuff because you never want people to call attention to the fact that it didn't quite feel right during a breakaway scene or, or whatever it might be. Also the ending, also the ending needed, needed a lot of work. And we took yeah. time. I mean, we brought in a guy who had worked with Apatow and McKay, and and he he helped us out. And I took a bit of a break. I went on vacation for ten days, and you know, got off my Nick Red gum. And uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we also went, reshot. We also reshot. We reshot a couple scenes. That's right. Yeah, the o that. with the opening. Yeah, and uh, certain other aspects the of whole, it. Um, synagogue yeah. scene was Syn in there off right. the top. So mm -hmm. we they spent the money to reshoot that into. Yeah, that helped a lot. I forgot about that. We had a so whole dining that, scene. So that reshooting, work. that was yeah. a scene that had been shot or was a newly written no, scene? No, newly written scene. Okay. And uh, just uh, uh, some other pickups, like, you know, the, the scene in, in the dressing room where at the end where, you know, all the way through Xavier Laflamme has been walking across the logo. And then the team stops walking across the logo and only Laflamme walks across it. We never had one where Laflamme didn't walk across it. It's like, ah, we don't fucking need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> so, with, you know, little, I was doing Silent Hill at the time and stealing corridor. equipment and everything else and built a little corridor and, and, and shot that. And it was it's a big moment to the movie. It was really funny. The day we shot that was the last thing we ever shot. And just the image, we were in that coal mine. Or what is it? That coal thing? And Oh, uh, uh, the Hearn generator. Massive class. cavernous place. And there's this burning, like, what do you call it? The... Roundabout or what did you call it? Oh, the merry-go-round. The merry-go-round for his horror film. They had this massive merry-go-round in the middle of this cold thing on fire, and thirty feet away, it's us with like four <laughs> hockey players and a <laughs> fake thing and a techno crane, which was something I'd never had before in the entire shoot. I was like, oh, no cranes. We borrowed it. Yeah, they borrowed it. They had it next door. We're like, can we borrow your techno crane? He's like, sure. <laughs> so I had the beautiful shot of the logo. And do you think Don, because you've done the hundred movies and counting. Um, is this, does this happen more often than not? Reshooting pickups? Yeah. I mean, maybe not. Should we it be happens thinking about a lot it more? On, on my movies, on my big movies, is you, you go, I, you know, it's not there. We need to do something. I mean, on Resident Evil 5, we came back and we shot for four days. 
entire new sequence that uh, had never been planned. We thought it was fine, but then when we watched it, we said, you know, it's missing something. So we did that. I mean, Silent Hill, we did reshoots. Uh, I mean, I, and this so was after many the times. test screening on this yeah. particular on Goon that you did this. And the yep. ADR with the pickup lines and the new writing, was that also after the test screenings? Uh, yep. Yeah, yep. that was an yep. ongoing thing yep. where you try to get people to get actors to do stuff into their mics, like on their computers and just like little throwaway jokes and try to build the ADR as much as you can before the screenings. But um, there's that phase and then there's also the phase of, of um, actually doing proper ADR. And that's where you really condense it. And um, and then you throw away most of it in the mix, to be yeah. honest. But the stuff that that retains That's itself. That was works. another couple of the associate producers. <laughs> they were Evan Goldberg's gnomes who helped them, and they the guy sat there and brainstormed for it you know great. weeks, coming up with lines that we can put into the the goalie or off camera or the announcer, especially. That's the thing about Evan is that he has a team of these writers right. that they work on all their stuff, and and you have these guys, and they. You know, they, they'll work their nuts off getting, just churning out jokes, churning out, like, not all of them work. And in fact, the, the percentage of, of success is very low, mm -hmm. but the ones that do work really work. Mm -hmm. And they're amazing. And they just add another layer. Sometimes I think yeah. it's, it's too much. You see films and there's a ton of ADR and it doesn't, it's like kind of overwhelming. But I think we find the right balance where it's enough, mm -hmm. it's hidden enough and it's not all, all the time. And Mark, you clearly must have been very supportive of going out to do whatever it took, the reshooting. Except for giving, yeah. giving more money. Yeah. I was going to say, that which was my next question to Don, my God, did you have to hit people up for more money? Or We tried. <laughs> well, you did. They, they went, I mean, I'll say this to you. We guys. got a little more money for the music from uh, Telefilm. A little more. Thank you very much, Dan Lyons and Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but, uh, yeah, for the reshoots and stuff, no, we put it all up. We toasted the contingency and we'd already given Leif Schreiber most of our fees and you know, so we just You've heard, did heard what it we here did. twice tonight. Even Don Carmody defers his fees. <laughs> that was surprising to me. Um, or has to. Um, but these are independent films, and this is what it takes to make an independent film here. And this, what I'm hearing from all of you, which I, I think is really important, is that theme of everybody agreed that they didn't want to make a so-so movie. And, and that seems to be underlying from the very beginning. And that's, it's that goodwill that finds the solutions. I mean, you have to at least have that. You all have to be on the same page of what you're trying to do. So then it's TIFF. I mean, had you planned when, it, so I say it's TIFF. After you finished the film, it launched at TIFF for a, for a premiere in 2011, but obviously the conversations about where to take the film, it might not have been an obvious festival film with what you were trying to do. Tell us a bit about your process in establishing how you were gonna take this film out and when did that start and, you know, was well, one? we knew that TIFF was uh, a marketplace. Obviously, Goon is not a festival movie, per se. Um, South by Southwest, maybe. But um, uh, we wanted to show the picture at TIFF. It was ready, or nearly ready. And we knew that it was a marketplace to try and get a U.S. sale, which we thought was key. And uh, so we, we raced to, to get things ready for TIFF. The picture was actually not 100% complete. Uh, the music was right, not yeah. uh, uh, the music that we eventually ended up affording and clearing. Uh, and uh, the mix was a very rough mix. Um, there were even some other cuts that we had to, to still make. Um, but we got in. TIFF was very supportive. And, um, you know, right after the first screening, we got into a bit of a bidding war with different distributors. And, uh, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning closed the deal with uh, Magnolia and the Thompson Hotel. And that must have been, so who was involved in that? You and... and uh, David Gross and Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. It's and interesting, it was, though. We have to tell you, as the domestic distributor, we had no intention to come to the festival. The award wasn't part of the game plan. You felt like, who needs to go to a festival with a com movie that's clearly commercial, uh, that wasn't coming out right away, you know? We had already engaged the exhibitors and the media during production, so we didn't sort of need to introduce it at that point. The, even the head, the head film buyer for Cineplex came out for a skate in... in, in uh, in a couple of days partying in, in um, <laughs> Winnipeg. <laughs> More important. More importantly. Um, but it was so clear that the, the sales guys that these guys were working with needed that platform for this thing to happen in. And they were, I mean, they were adamant that if we fail to not only get into TIFF and deliver TIFF, but also 
on a particular night and a particular venue. Yeah. Like they felt so strongly that all those little subtleties were going to make a huge difference of whether or not it was going to get a meaningful sale or not. Um, we felt like we had no choice but to proceed because, of course, the U.S. sale affects the Canadian, re you know, release and do potentially. Do you agree anyway. then, having been able to announce a U.S. sale, which is always a big deal at TIFF and certainly for Canadian films, bigger than even some films? How much did that help you in the awareness of the film? I mean, I got to tell you the truth. For Canada, I don't, I don't, don't think it helped me that much. I think the film was going to work in Canada on its own merits. You, ho you always hope there'll be some with everything you work on, these massive U.S. release that will spill across endless, you know, uh, uh, talk show appearances and huge amounts of money, you know, spending. Well, I know we're going to talk about it in a minute, but the new model in the States of this VOD stuff actually makes a lot of challenges for us, um, both in um, awareness building and also uh, in anti-piracy. Okay, well, we'll get to that almost immediately. Yeah. But I liked what you said about you already had talked to the distributors. You'd had Michael Kennedy, I take it, out on the ice. Um, we had him body checked by Liev. Yeah. Actually, Michael does like to visit sets. We all yeah. know that. So uh, I think he probably particularly liked this one, though. Um, well, TIFF really helped, uh, you know, the foreign sales. We foreign made sales. a Absolutely. lot of sales, plus the U.S. sale. UK. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, UK, UK especially with Z1 and, yeah. uh, you know, who... Um, and we'll get to that in a okay. minute. But if we could just, Mark, you talked about how early on you had engaged through production the exhibitors and your idea. So you, heading into September, thinking about a 2012 <coughs> release, what had you already done? Part of our model in general, but particularly so on Goon, was the idea that all the pre-awareness that comes with U.S. films, they production is covered. Everybody knows two years in advance what the next sort of big movies are going to be. You see teaser trailers quite early. We don't have that. And what often happens or what was happening was we'd come with a Canadian film, even one of a bigger budget and a higher quality and take it to exhibition and they'd never heard of it. They're like, you want 150 screens for what? And, and they're like, well, I'm sorry, but we've been planning an orderly release of all these Hollywood movies. There's no room for you. Maybe you can get 30, maybe you can get 40. And so what we've started to develop is this idea that you have to engage everybody the whole way along and, and sell them on the idea. So because there's a, a virtual monopoly and exhibition in Canada, um, there's a handful of guys who are extraordinarily important when it comes to trying to get screens for your film. And if you cannot get them on board, there's no way your theatrical release is going to be meaningful. So one of the things we did was we invited um, Mike, this guy, Mike Kennedy, who's the, who's the head film buyer for Cineplex. Really good guy. He really knows movies, too. But at the same time, we knew that if he was engaged with the, the thing early, we would have a much better chance down the road. He also hosts this thing on Air Canada. You know, he must he's the guy with the white hair and who hosts that coming soon thing. So he shoots those things too while he goes out there. So it gives him extra reason to do it. But, you know, he meets the guys. They're all cool guys. And we, we you know, we went out to a couple of parties with him and showed him Probably. a good <laughs> And showed him a good time. We also bring some of the media out with us at that point. We do, um, we've conceptualized uh, things like key art and we start trying to do the shooting for the key art at that point so that we'll, we'll have materials that are ready to go. Also, what we won't have to do later is try to recreate things. So, you know, people get haircuts, they're not available, they're in costume, particularly here where there's all this hockey gear and stuff. So you actually get everybody and you've got all that material. And what's good, I think, for the producers is we also can then deliver that material to other distributors around the world so they don't have to start from absolute zero. Um, we're better able to share trailers, posters, DVD extras, encodings for um, iTunes and, and Google Play and all that stuff down the road. So we're really trying at the pre-production stage to come up with what all of those sort of steps will look like. And if we think festivals are in the cards, we also start in engaging the uh, the festival programmers too, even at that early stage. So they they knew Goon was a common back then, long before there was anything to actually show them. So you agreed, thank you, you agreed to go along with the decision for TIFF because it helped the foreign sales. You made your U.S. sale, followed by the U.K. sale. TIFF is over. What are the conversations then about releasing the film? I understand that in an unusual, this is quite an unusual case that UK went out first, or, or a foreign terror go, goes out first. Usually yeah, the UK, uh, uh, E1 approached us about the UK. Uh, they were very uh, high on the movie, and we were always like, well, it's great, but, you know, hockey in the United Kingdom. But they said, we've got an extraordinary opportunity, we think, early January, there is nothing but the Iron Lady coming out. And everybody's gotten out of the way of the Iron Lady because they're afraid of it. So we want a counter-program, and we want to go with Goon. But that means going out before your Canadian or North American release. And a lot of people were really, really nervous. Magnolia was nervous. Uh, Alliance were nervous. There were talk about piracy and all of this. And eventually, 
you know, they said, uh, we're going to spend, if you let us do this, we'll spend this much money launching the movie. And, Which um, I assume was a lot. It was, yeah, it was a substantial for this kind of movie in the United Kingdom. And they went out and they did an amazing job. I know my daughter was working over there. And she said, you can't turn around without seeing a poster for Goon. And that was in London. So, and then she was also up in Sheffield, and she saw it there. And the picture did extraordinarily well. And it was something that told us right off the top that this picture is going to play to different quadrants. This is not just the, the fanboys. This is not just the hockey thugs. This is, you know, the picture has heart, which we knew, but we were getting across. And the word of mouth was extraordinary. And Sean's films had always overperformed in the UK, they had said, and I think they also saw the writing on the wall with the VOD release as well, and probably wanted to get out in, in front of that with a proper window. Yeah. And the counter-programming sounds like a very smart yeah. idea, because it doesn't strike one as the same audience as Iron Lady, um, initially, <laughs> until you get those other quadrants, you know? Well, you Film know, we wanted to accommodate Meryl in our movie, but there was no role. Yeah. So. And were you nervous about that, Mark? Uh, UK going out first? On like a hundred different ways, I was I yeah. was petrified about it. Yeah, I mean the, the you're always a little worried that you're going into a market that's not a hockey market, and that somehow it's going to get some bad reception, and that will will reflect right. poorly back here somehow. You're worried about the biggest issue was the the piracy worry, which was that that every kid would have already seen the film before we even opened our uh, opened the doors. Um, but in the end of the day, I mean, as the producers came and put in, particularly David, you know, uh, uh, Don, you'll remember, was very nervous about earning the money back. And it was a big sale, you know, and it was a partnership thing. I was already dreaming that there would be a goon too. And so, you know, this was one of those things that we, we on our side, um, both in how we agreed uh, uh, to relate to Magnolia's plans for the States and for the UK said, we're not going to put up a big stink because ultimately it's the best thing for the film in the bigger sense and, and as a partner. That's what, you know, yeah, do what you have to do. And did the UK, so which was very successful, clearly helped you uh, in many ways, Don, on the production side, because it helps you pay back your investors. Did it bleed over for you, Mark, in terms of the domestic market? Uh, you mean, do you mean piracy? Or no, the success. Not, you know what, the reality is not really. I, I you know, you always, you're, you get so close to these things, you think that the whole world is just hanging on every foreign, you know, little foreign o opening that happens. The reality was the media here didn't really glom on to it in that way. They, they, owned it as a Canadian film and were extraordinarily uh, uh, supportive of it. But they, there weren't people sort of, you know, scoping it out in, in, in things. Online, mind you, there was a good, you know, a good buzz. And there was also uh, piracy at the time. And we had sort of put anti-piracy measures in place before that release. And indeed, a hell of a lot of... of uh, piracy out of the UK? Very little from... Uh, well, you're only comparing it to what happened after. Oh, but <laughs> yeah, no yeah, I guess... But, it will. It, <laughs> it was a nice test. I mean, it was nice to, to throw it out there and see well, it. Well, it showed see you something about the reaction to the film, which you were perhaps not. It was a pleasant surprise. But uh, for you guys, I mean, I think it was nice. A, a traditional theatrical release worked in a non-hockey market. For, for sure, for sure, for sure. I mean, it, it went against common wisdom. So the people at E1 who are very smart and, you know, <laughs> clever people, <laughs> who I will get along very well with, if, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, were you know definitely saw that opportunity and they exploited it and I did it did say something I'll tell you it also made me think the U.S. thing was going to be massively bigger at the time I thought if it can work in the U.K. this thing should work in absolutely yeah America. and yeah. Uh, it, it helped so Marriott obviously two. sell other foreign territories. How many screens did it go out in the U.K. Do you recall? I think yeah. three, which is a huge release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. indie film absolutely. So cut to your building for the February release in Canada, and you know you've got Magnolia in the U.S. How did you work together on that um, in terms of materials, in terms of how you planned the campaign? Did you share the same trailer? Did you work that closely? Or had you, because you were so involved early on, did you build it all first? We had built our whole campaign first. We had very clear ideas what we wanted to do. There were teaser materials. We had a big website thing going on. We had created a, uh, you know, an iPhone game or it was a Facebook game, whatever, like a, like a, a social media type thing. And uh, so a lot of our stuff was already in place, but we know those guys really well at Magnolia and we had started talking. The really um, tricky part is the window issue. Yeah, so it's, you know, when is your stuff going to run? How is it going to run? How will that coincide with what we're doing? Will DVDs, what, what DVDs will be out at what time? The border is very porous uh, for f physical goods, forget about on the internet. Um, so a lot of the discussion with them went on about how best to maximize those opportunities on both sides. And certainly we had an open sharing back and forth of materials and a very uh, healthy discussion with those guys because they, they, they know their market too. They know their business. Yeah. I mean, the, the big thing was the premium VOD, which is their big sale 
to us because they had done margin call and, and a few other pitchers had been extraordinarily successful on premium VOD, which for those that don't know what it is, is basically they offer this VOD 30 days before the theatrical release of the movie. You have the opportunity to see the movie in your the privacy of your own home for th like 30 bucks. It's a fairly premium price. And one of the things that, you know, they had showed us all the numbers and how it had worked on these movies and everything else. And, you know, I was saying, what about piracy? Oh, no, no, they, it's not a download. You have to go up to get it and you can't get it. But, of course, you know, genius is us. We didn't realize nobody stole Margin Call because none of the kids who steal these movies wanted to see Margin Call. Richard Gere, bleh, you know, that type of thing. Um, and, you know, no genius realized you don't have to go up to get a perfect DVD that you can put in BitTorrent the next day. All you have to do is have it on your HD television and film it right off of the screen with your HD camera or your iPhone, and you've got a perfect copy, better than most, you know, the ones that you're getting out of India or that you can buy at any convenience store here in Toronto, unfortunately. So the piracy was massive and immediate for several reasons. That the picture was a, a hard R, uh, despite toning down the violence, it was still a lot of swearing, a lot of, a lot of violence. The theater owners were being very protective about letting kids in. So the kids couldn't get in easily. So it became a perfect target for them to buy off of the, uh, the internet or download from BitTorrent for free. And the piracy was massive. And basically killed the U.S. release of the movie. There's 900 seeds on Pirate Bay on the Saturday after, after the. And, and remember, this is yeah. that many seeds are out there. And remember, this is we're paying agencies to go on there and try to, you know, somehow, you know, uh, contain to play whack-a-mole. It's like whack-a-mole. That's it. And they are, you know, there's an incredible. Th there was, I mean, part of you as a distributor is kind of happy because clearly there's this huge desire for people to want to see the movie. The speed with which these things would come up and you can tell on the seeds by who's done the encoding that it wasn't just one guy who was out there but this was like an you know an effort that was being taken on by clearly many people to, to get it out and distribute it so you know it feels good in one way but the volume of it was very disheartening yeah what, what we found was that that what you always want when you make a film that i that need oh i gotta go see it again or i gotta tell all my friends i get superseded by let's just steal it and show it to everybody and nobody's going to the theater like, and do you going, think that's and do you think that's true? Because there's a lot of people out there that suggest that it actually ups the awareness and the marketing, and you still get people out. But not, clearly, that's not I the way. You're I, I don't think so. It it didn't stop until the the premium VOD window shut, and then it was available on regular VOD day and date with the theatrical release, and you could buy it on Amazon.com and iTunes for you know a reasonable amount of money. That slowed the piracy. It it, it did slow the piracy down. Um, but the kind of the one good thing is that we had built up so much word of mouth in the United States that the downloads, uh, when they were at a reasonable price, became incredible. And people were watching the movie over and over again. And that's one of the things about Goon is that it is one of the most repeated watched movies of the year. People will see this thing seven, eight, nine times. So I guess there's no way to scientifically know that if there hadn't been the level of piracy... <sighs> Would there have been the same level of downloads? And I'm not making a case for piracy. I, I just think, think it's. I think it was a weird, perfect storm where you had a, you know, a big release in Canada, and you just happened, which is rare that it, you get that coordination of things. Right. And everybody who sort of responded to it in Canada, their first instinct was it was readily available to be pirated. Right. Which, and so you, this yeah, is Mark over to you. Over to Canada. It crossed over to Canada. So not oh, only yeah. did Terrible. it yeah. tank Terrible. the. It goes both ways. I mean, the discussion, of course, happening online is a very positive thing right there's a lot of great back and forth and you know we're, we're you're following all the commentary as one guy's post gets gets replied to and and uh, and, and disseminated but uh, i i believe what don what you were getting at which is the premium price for a movie that's inherently for a younger audience who for whom 30 bucks is more that's so you know what right. i mean created this situation where stealing it felt a little better a little more okay whereas yeah. 3.99 or whatever to, you know is a little more tolerable for somebody that might not want to go through the trouble of so I'd would, never make another premium VOD for that type of movie. Would you go? Would you allow for a day and date VOD theatrical in the U.S.? Uh, I, I think I think as no. soon as it goes digital, it's pirated. pirated I mean, yeah. As long as you have a film that people want to pirate. 
Yeah. It's um I mean they can steal it from the theater as well, but uh, it's harder though. Harder, yeah. And it's less quality. I think two theatricals know. day and date still makes a lot of sense, but not a VOD and any sort of mix of a VOD. Once it's on VOD, it's done. Yeah. Just done. The, the problem is, though, the U.S. model now has be, there's a company set up specifically to exploit the films this way. You know, they're yeah. they're VOD first. They're they're paying an MG that's usually equal to what they expect to earn on VOD, and there so they're kind of covered there. And then if a theatrical gets going and 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 it's great, but if it doesn't, they're not at, in a huge risk position. But for a Canadian going out with traditional windows, we're still putting all this P and A up front. Some of it's subsidized by Telefilm, of course, but nonetheless, you're putting a huge amount of risk out there right in front. Uh, without this kind of guarantee number that's going to come in. And, and again, it and depends on who your audience is. I mean, it makes sense t for a drama or, you know, a David Cronenberg movie perhaps or, you know, Sarah Pauly. They're not going to steal that. Because those know. audience don't know quite where to go. Well, they don't know how to do it, number one. It's sad but true. And nor do they have the, the patience to do it. I mean, everything well. gets pirated, but it's the volume is not there for that yeah. stuff, yeah. So. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Charlotte is uh, from E1 is talking about the the fact that there have been successes on the premium VOD. Uh, E1 did a film sold to Magnolia, same company called The Hunt Hunter. Hunter, yeah. Hunter. Willem and Dafoe's it, movie. Yeah, the, yeah, and it instead did very very well in that space. Yeah. Older yeah. audience movie. So. Right. Yeah. The other thing that uh, that I find really strange, and I never really understood this was that we had heard from all kinds of people that their kids had gone to see the movie. And I'd say, how old is the kid? 12 or 14 or 13 or whatever. This is an R-rated movie. This is an R-rated movie. And the, and the theater owners were pretty strict about enforcing it because, again, it was pretty out there. And what these kids would do, they go in packs, 10, 14 at a time, and buy tickets to the Muppets and go into Goon. So what we so. need to do is is make sure we have a... A, a yeah. PG film. As Mark was saying, all of a sudden again. you'd see these Disney movies or these, you know, whatever, and all of a sudden in their third or fourth week there's this big bump and you can't figure it out. It's because they're doing this. <laughs> That's a good time to open this up to you. Um, raise any hands. I think there's some, I don't know if there's any mics, are there, that are being passed around? I can't see very well, but maybe, oh, there's the mic. Would anybody like to lead off a question? Over here, Paul. Um, I'm curious, how many international markets did you manage to sell it into? Obviously, the UK sale was rather exceptional, but given the fact that it's hockey, did this sell in fewer territories than one would expect? or did it Israel, happen? the Middle East, China. <laughs> We've been invited to the Beijing Film Festival. I'm like, what? <laughs> did we get in? I don't know. Uh -huh. Pass the censors. Russia? Oh, yeah, Russia, yeah. yeah. Russia was an early sale, yeah. No, we sold lots. Uh, lots and lots. Australia, yeah, a lot of territories. Yeah, I, I think we're pretty sold by now, anyway. I mean, there's some. Latvia. No, no, that's Russian. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I don't know if Indonesia bought it or whatever. But. Other questions? Well, just speak up when you've got one, because <laughs> these guys can keep on talking. What we got into was that initial platform, but clearly... This went on to make this film $5 million, 5.2 in Canada alone. Um, how many screens did it go in in Canada? What was your process in terms of when did you realize this was going? What did, on that opening weekend, what were your expectations, I guess from both of your points of view or any of your points of view? And what did you do when you saw that opening weekend? And how did that, how does that determine? Well, just to set, set the table then, we, we went out on, on a wide release that comparable to, you know, many of the Hollywood films we do. So it's around 200 screens, including a, a, a dub into French, uh, which we were talking a little bit before, is not at all a typical thing for Canadian, English Canadian films, rarely get dubbed into, into French. And as you may know, Quebecers don't usually see subtitled films, they see dubbed movies, but they have the choice of their own Quebec films in French or uh, films from Hollywood that have been dubbed. So it's not usual that they make the decision uh, that to distribute the English Canadian ones dubbed. This one was because it it had it starred a big star in Quebec, Marc Andre Grandin, who also happened to be the star star of the film. He's in an incredibly important role and gives an amazing performance in the movie. It's just fabulous. So we had had a simultaneous release planned uh, with one marketing campaign for Quebec and another one for English Canada. 
Um, we always knew that, we, and we promised to telefilm, and we'd always had the money set aside for a, a huge TV budget, which the lion's share of the spending went on to television advertising. Um, and then a... And where, which TV channels? What, where did you advertise on television? When you buy TV, it's usually a combination of buying uh, awareness with the audience in general. So in other words, just keep hitting the same people over the head again and again with... Uh, the same message and you use cable for that kind of thing along with certain specialty programming obviously buying on a lot of sports um, but also things like Sunday night cartoon nights and, and those kind of things that that where you get the specific audience you want and that's a psychographic uh, you know kind of buy there um, and we use the internet uh, for advertising and for uh, uh, awareness building in a huge way it doesn't cost so much so the, the percentage of the budget isn't big but the amount of activity that went on there was huge very little in newspaper advertising, which is increasingly becoming a, uh, a, a, a lame duck kind of medium for almost all film, with the exception of prestige stuff. Um, we did some radio, and we did a huge publicity campaign, including Mike traveling quite a bit to support the film in market to market, because personal appearances do make a big difference in um, in, in local box office grosses. When all the other actors refused to. Yeah, they, all, they all did, but you're, you're a trooper. <laughs> so how much, you did a lot of traveling, Mike, you went across the country, did you? Yeah, we did. Uh, we did screenings in Winnipeg, Vancouver, uh, Montre Mon Montreal. No, we didn't do Calgary. Yeah. No, and then we did Montreal, which was great in the old forum. Yeah, which was an awesome. RDS doing a live hit, uh, which means nothing to you, Leaf fans. <laughs> um, and um, and then obviously Toronto, and then it was sort of a whirlwind uh, two weeks of touring and doing that stuff, and then went right to New York for the U.S. release. They were very incredibly supportive of the Lions did on both sides, the French, the French side as well, um, especially with the dub. The dub, they took a lot of uh, attention to it, and it's usually a dub is sort of, there's a standard way of doing it, but this one they really took the time to translate it properly. And into, to cast into, into uh, the parts. actors for the yeah, different voices. Yeah, to cast the, the right actors for the parts and, um, yeah. and to make sure the, the comedy translated. Yeah. Grandin did Grandin. Well, Jay did Grandin in French. <laughs> Good oh, and, and he was helpful also in sort of the translating and making sure sort of being an eye in the dubs studio making sure that the, all the jokes worked and also having the same mixer too who was sort of mm. understood everything in English was able to mix the French dub as well and what percentage like it did well in Quebec you were saying so it actually worked this paid off because it's very unusual for a film to do well in both uh, markets we actually were somewhat disappointed because uh, the alliance the French side and alliance were really thinking this picture was going to go big and that we was we're, we were going to be bigger than bone cop bad cop which didn't happen kind of pissed me off but because Kevin Tierney a little shit but it sounds anyway. like you might have another chance <laughs> So but it didn't do, but it did well. It did well in the big cities, and the ancillaries did very well also. I mean, one of the other sad realities of releasing English-Canadian film is you you spending a lot of money, and you are raising awareness. But like I talked about before, you have to give the same people the same message multiple times to actually get them out of the house, get the money out of their pocket, and buy a ticket. You're still not ever spending the kind of money that the big Hollywood guys are spending. And so what, what my, my theory and my conclusion on this has been that we are – seeing a lot of reverberation and ancillaries. In other words, we've, we've made enough people aware and we've interested in enough people to want to see the film but haven't always pushed everybody over the edge to making a theatrical commitment to us. But they do then make that commitment in digital and, and DVD later. Yeah, we, we got incredibly lucky here in uh, Toronto as well when uh, I teased Jay about this because I accused his mother of doing it, calling the TDC and complaining about the poster of Jay. <laughs> right, tell us about that. That actually was all online. I, I remember that. Um, it was so they, it, it went viral around the world. Wow. Literally around the world how Toronto was so uptight that they would pull down this poster. Well, that's always good. Bad. Uh, and, and let's get back to just for a moment then something I made a, a hint at. You were marketing a film about the hockey enforcer, We Polite Canadians, and talking about how you get over that fact that there was an awful lot of publicity. Obviously, you made it work in your favor. Did you do it by taking it head on, or did you do it because you promoted the film the way you felt it was a story? You know, Mike actually set the tone, I think, at one of our first premiere screenings. Do you remember? You gave a little speech there about those guys. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, I mean, it's something that me and Jay always talked about, is that it's, it's our, it's, we love these guys. And, and you know, it's, we, I wanted to deal with it head on and, and not be ashamed of the film that I made and not, backtrack on it at all because I think we um, I think the point of view is a, it's a celebration of these guys and 
it's not clean, it's not perfect, it's complicated, it's as complicated as any human is, you know, the, the issues, but um, I wanted to be respectful of what happened, but also not stand back from our point of view of making the film, that these guys do have a role and it's not, you know, there is victims and there's a, you know, there's a price to pay for paying that role, but... Um, it was something I, I tried to deal with head on and, and try to be. When you have that absolutely beautiful scene between Liev and Sean in the, in the bar. Yeah, um, I feel which like it's kind we, of philosophical. We, dealt, in that we tried in the film. We tried to deal with all aspects of it, of, of that idea of, 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 a, of an enforcer being tossed away at the end of his career, and that, and as well as we tried to deal with the head head injuries and the concussions through the character of Laflamme, and, and and at least address it when we were making it. And obviously, when we when it was being written and prep was you know years, a year and a half, two years before the. the and was there any about. backlash or any conversation around it during that, or was it largely? I remember one poor CBC reporter tried to backlash me, and I, I gave it to her pretty good. It was you good. Know, the, the majority of the editorials, though, were understood. They understood. Yeah. You know, the point of this movie was not to say that, that it was not to condone, but it was to present a picture in 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 the context of the comedy that it was. And uh, I found, for the most part, there was some. Vi and what was interesting was a lot of people editorialized in the papers and stuff as news editorial. You know, it wasn't just entertainment reporting, but there was a lot of actual real discussion about it. And I was amazed how many people got it. Well, maybe I shouldn't be amazed, but but everybody seemed to get it. Oh, yeah. And th there was a four-part uh, series in the New York Times about Bogart and his, you know, suicide and everything. I was like, and I, I didn't know a whole lot about, you know, the hockey enforcer uh, milieu. And I m remember sending an email after I'd read this series and going, if this had come out before we made the movie, we would have been sued because it's our movie. You know, without the jokes. I mean, it was actually pretty interesting. But I think the real tribute to the movie is that we have now supplanted Slapshot as the favorite in right. the team dressing rooms and on the Ooh. team buses. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm hearing that from hockey players all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but keep I mean, it they, going. Don Don yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and, and you've talked about it, it being evergreen, and that's in... Now, did it exceed your expectations? Did it meet expectation? Has it exceeded for, expectation? For me? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In every way. And like Dawn said, I, I mean, without, without comparing to other film necessarily, but it delivered exactly what we said. We were, you know, Mike had this vision when he talked about it for the first time, which was to set out to make the quintessential Canadian hockey movie, and I will say that I think you did exactly that. Here, here. Don, feel the same way? Uh, I'm very proud of the picture. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it's to cheer myself up, I'll go on Twitter, even a year after, you know, the release. And I'll just, every 30 <laughs> seconds, there's a tweet coming up about how people love this movie. And the quotes, I mean, they just repeat the lines to each other over and over again. It's quite phenomenal. Yeah, it's great. I'm really proud of the group work that everybody put into it and... and you know, the producers did a did a fantastic job of supporting, and some might argue supporting me too much. Do you know what I mean? And really, there was when I needed more music, there was music. Somehow they found a way to get music in the budget, and it was always a question of the quality of the film. And I think so many times there's a there's a thing of like bottom line. And I know it's a I know it's it's part of the reality of making a film, but a lot of producers, it's like, well, we have our we have what we're going to keep, our ten percent, and all this stuff, and. But these guys were willing to sacrifice that, and they could see down the road a little bit. And hopefully, they're going to get rewarded from that. They don't tell me anything about that, but um, <laughs> hopefully, all their they might not have will heard anything. Back. Maybe Mark can say more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you got your deferral back? Your fees that you gave for Liev? No, I'm on paper. Um, we are going to be in profit. Um, have we got the money back yet? No. I mean, everybody <laughs> hangs on to it until the last possible moment. But uh, no, I mean, the, the foreign sales are coming in, the, the money from E1 starting to come in, Alliance. I mean, a large part of the revenue of this picture is in you know, DVD <laughs> and VOD and, and, and that type of stuff, which will go on. And uh, actually, it was uh, Victor Louis who said to me that the picture should be an evergreen that uh, will continue to sell. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a hunger out there for more on Goon, so we're, we're hopefully going to make Goon too. Um, then there's the director's cut, as I told Mike, uh, the DVD of, and then we have tons will, and will tons. Will that broken ankle be on that? <laughs> no. Actually, no? At the cut, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of out. Uh, there's a lot of outtakes. There's a lot of additional scenes. There's a, 
tremendous amount of behind the scenes uh, footage that uh, that we have and things like that. So it it does let us you know exploit the movie down the line, and uh, I think that uh, it's be becoming kind of culty. So uh, I think it'll support that. So you know a thing or two about cults. Are there any other questions from the crowd? <laughs> <laughs> Having created a cult film in Boondog Saints. Several of them, yeah. yeah. Several of them. Um, yeah. Not those other cults. Um, any other questions? It's hard for me to see, so just enjoying the chat. I think at this point, having led to uh, Goon 2, are you going to be involved in Goon 2? There's been a lot on Twitter and online about that. According to Jay, yes. According to Jay, <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I think so. I see. mean, it's, it's such a great group of people. It's... I would be an idiot not to do it. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun making the film, and um, it's a great group of guys, and we all have the same shared yeah. goal. Might mess with success. Yeah, yeah as long as we success. get the story right, but I have all the faith that we'll get. I, I think, actually, the lockouts provided us great fodder. For um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Really, I just want to see Doug Glatt in wall-to-wall -wall advertising on his uniform beating the shit out of Russians. That's sort yeah. of <laughs> that's my one goal. <laughs> that's great. Well, on that note... Um, we all look forward to Goon 2. For those of you who haven't seen the first Goon, it is playing in Cinema 3 here at TIFF Lightbox at 9.30. In the meantime, there's a reception cocktail that you've heard about just uh, on the second floor. So please, please join our, our panelists and please join me in thanking them for giving their time and stories today.